Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webinar is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning. This webinar is brought to you by the Special Interest Group for Artificial Intelligence called SIG-AI, and specifically the SIG-AI Industry Committee. We're planning to have monthly webinars on different topics of interest for those in industry and academics as well. I'm Rose Paradis, Secretary Treasurer for the SIG-AI and member of the SIG-AI Industry Liaison Committee. Um, I am a Principal Research Engineer for LIDOS, Data Analytics Products and Services, where I work as a data scientist for Big Data Analytics. And my work focuses on data and text analytics, computational linguistics, natural language processing. I work with a team of computer scientists to build tools that use artificial intelligence and machine learning models for data insights. Plaman Petrov, another moderator on today's um, presentation, is the industry liaison officer for SIG AI. And he's the director of the Cognitive Technology at KPMG LLP, where he applies his advanced artificial intelligence and data science techniques to drive business transformation within KPMG and at KPMG clients. He's also the lab director for the dedicated intelligent automation lab within KPMG Ignition and works with a team of highly skilled resources that utilize leading tools and approaches to build AI solutions. His work focuses on areas such as natural language processing, probabilistic knowledge representation and reasoning, machine learning, and other algorithms. He also serves on the faculty of the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he teaches grad courses on AI, natural language processing, and cognitive analysis. Today's presentation is Advances in Socio-Behavioral Computing by Dope by Dr. Tomek Tchaikovsky. You can find more info on our backgrounds in the bio widget on your screen. And let me just take a few minutes to go over some ACM and SIG AI information before we start. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or SIG AI or what it has to offer, here's more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster and enhance career opportunities and our members can stay competitive in this constantly changing world of computing um, with a bunch of, which, with a number of different ACM Learning Center resources. Um, you can see more of the highlights on your screen. And I especially want to point out the ACM Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence. This group is made up of academic and industrial researchers, practitioners, software developers, and users and students. I have a number of goals here, but most Mostly our goal is to promote and support the growth and application of AI principles and techniques throughout computing. We also sponsor a number of conferences and awards. Um, so you can definitely go to the SIG AI link and look up more information on SIG AI. Um, before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the webinar. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, please press the F5 key in Windows, Command plus R on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Or you can just close and relaunch the presentation. That's generally the problem most of the time. Uh, to control the volume, just to control the, adjust the master volume on your computer. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar. Click the Submit button. Um, Plaman and I are going to organize the questions as Tomek speaks, and then we'll have some time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session also is being recorded and will be archived. You'll receive an automated email notification when it becomes available. And you can check the learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. There's also going to be a short survey at the end that you can take. It will take less than two minutes. Please take that um, let us know um, if you have other topics or questions about these webinars that we're doing. All right, now we can start. So today's presentation is Advances in Socio-Behavioral Computing again. Professor Tomek Strakowski is Director of the Institute for Informatics, Logics, and Security Studies. Um, ILS at albany.edu, and Professor of Computer Science at SUNY Albany. Prior to joining SUNY, he was a Natural Language Group Leader and Principal Scientist at GE R&D, um, and before that, a faculty at the Courant Institute of New York University. 
He's also done research in computational linguistics and sociolinguistics, information retrieval, question answering, human computer dialogue, serious games, social media analytics, formal semantics, and reversible grammars. He's directed, he's directed research sponsored by IOPRA, DARPA, ARL, AFRL, NSF, and the European Commission, and CERC, as well as a number of industry-funded projects. He was involved in IBM's Jeopardy Challenge and advanced question answering. Dr. Strakowski has published over 100 scientific papers and is the editor of several books, including Advances in Open Domain Question Answering. So Tomek, without further ado, please take it away. Um, thank you, Rose. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I want to thank you, um, both of you, uh, for uh, this introduction. I also want to thank um, uh, ACM and the SIG AI for giving me this opportunity to speak to you and uh, to all um, um, folks in my audience, uh, good afternoon to you, uh, good morning or good evening, depending where you are, um, and I hope you enjoyed that presentation. So I will speak about um, social behavioral computing as a research area I've been involved in for um, most of the past decade. and. It's, uh, it's related to language processing, natural language processing, area of my interest, and also artificial intelligence, and also to uh, uh, computational social science. Um, and so I will try to uh, introduce you to this and, and guide you through this. So um, um, on the, uh, what is social behavioral computing then? Um, it is a study of computational models of human behavior in social interactions. We're interested in... Uh, development of such models and also validation of such models in practice, as well as finding applications for it in uh, um, both practical and industrial uh, environments. Our emphasis um, is on social interactions online, uh, mostly because there is uh, abundance of, uh, of data in this domain. Um, we're interested in discourse that occurs between people through messaging, through social media, also in, um, in games that people play online, multiplayer games, such as World of Warcraft, for instance, um, as well as other environments, collaborative environments, where people come together and build software projects, uh, solve problems, such as GitHub, for instance. Um, furthermore, we're also interested not only on the individual level uh, uh, in this, in this uh, um, phenomena, but also at a societal level where we um, talk about how groups or whole societies or cultures behave um, with respect to one another or internally. Um, so, um, the, so we are interested in the social and behavioral dimensions of this course. That's why I call it social behavioral computing. Um, and the reason I'm interested in it is because any discourse is a social interaction, um, whether it's a task or, or problem solving, uh, situation or is a negotiation of some kind or a debate of some kind or even when we are in the restaurant ordering food there is there is a social element to it so what happens is that of course more than the words that are being exchanged more happens than that a discourse reflects participants own goals and opinions and may influence other people goals and opinions that may support and disrupt other people's objectives that they may have in this discourse or may aim simply to find what other people think. So there are all kinds of objectives here that are beyond the words that are being exchanged. And that's what we're trying to get at. Um, a discourse takes, may take many forms. Uh, it could be face-to-face -face meetings. That's what we typically think of. But there could be telephone conversations, and we go online, and we have chat and email and social media and those multiplayer games. And then you can go beyond that. We, we can look at things like editorials in newspapers and scientific publications. People argue different points and so on and so on. And all of these cases, they are so complex social phenomena that uh, are observed, and you would like to catch them and, and, and formalize them and see if they are the same, and they, they, we, can, we can have a system of recognizing them. Um, so some of those um, social behavioral phenomena that would be of particular interest are listed here on this slide, um, such as, for instance, leader or leadership. A leader is a social role. 
uh, it's based on certain kinds of behaviors that people do. For instance, a leader guides others towards an outcome, manages interaction, uh, controls direction of discussion. Yeah? Um, but there's also other part of that, which is the other people recognize and defer to or maybe challenge the leader. So there has to be this reciprocity here. Right? Influence is another social role, very important too, very often we talk about that. Um, and what the influencer does, the influencer introduces ideas, maybe controls the agenda of some interaction, and also has credibility, which is something that they, they don't do, but they have, right? And others would um, pick up the ideas that the influencer introduces and then um, carry them on, right? So, so there has to be, again, this reciprocity. And you, know, you can have other behaviors, like pursuit of power, challenging someone, um, and so uh, what we will see here is that if, if, if it's challenged, then there, there, there's going to be some tension being caused. So we, we would want to see that kind of uh, reaction. And we can also look at the group level behaviors. That is not individual behaviors, but the groups as entities. Uh, how do they behave collectively? Now, for instance, a group is cohesive if it's persistent in its objectives and values over time. Right? So these are the kind of concepts we want to get at, and they can be recognized by certain behaviors that underlie them. So we want to see well, how we can get at those behaviors first. Um, so we would like to have a mechanism that we can recognize those social roles and states and the behaviors that underlie them, particularly looking at when people interact using language. That language is plentiful and it's cheap to look at this. Right? So that's why we want to do this. Um, so can we detect presence of such behaviors or other phenomena through language, through the way people use language? And, but by this we mean words as well as maybe sounds and body language maybe too in a face-to-face -face situation, but online we typically we only have words. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that the language doesn't not necessarily have to be natural language as English. Mostly it is. But it could be also some kind of elaborate command system. For instance, in GitHub, people communicate through commands. And, but still, the same phenomena occur. So um, I want to introduce the, um, a, a big chunk of this research that has been done as part of the project called Disarm. We started work on this earlier, but this project has made significant advance in our thinking. Uh, this project um, called Disarm, and it's, it stands for Detecting Social Actions and Roles in Multi-Party Dialogues, was part of a, a IARPA-funded skill program that ran between 2009-2013. Um, so the system was built to automatically recognize and categorize a subset of sociolinguistic behaviors that participants exhibit in a multi-party discourse and then combine and map them into a higher level phenomena and that show social dynamics in interaction. Um, <clears throat> so I explain some more details about that. So um, we, we, did, we start with a, a transcript of a, a conversation, a dialogue. So this is a little bit, little example here. Um, and, and it is a, um, a transcript of actually, this is, this is a, a, a chat room a conversation uh, between several people. Um, the topic is to um, review a, a, a set of resumes and select the best candidate for a, a position in a, a YMCA counselor. Um, and, um, and this goes for about an hour and a half, about 700 turns. So this is a tiny fragment here you see in the window, uh, somewhere near the beginning of this conversation. And so we take that, of course, we take the whole conversation or maybe larger part of this, and try to figure out what's going on in here between all these people. So we start with this raw discourse data. And, and then um, we extract from this all kinds of features that we can put our hands on. The dialogue acts would be one thing that we could get out of this. The communicative acts and types, who speaks to whom is the response or is it forward question and so forth. Um, topics that are being mentioned, and the co-reference to these topics, uh, topic change that occur in this conversation, 
polarity with which topics are being mentioned. It's a positive and negative uh, attitude towards something. And other things, part of speech information, some structural information, subject or object, anything we, we think is useful, all kinds of features that we construct. None of this is necessarily 100% correct, 100% perfect. We know how the technology works, but we put our hands on anything we can. Okay, so now, out of this, we would like to extract the behavior. So now we would like to see if we could uh, combine those features somehow that we can determine that there is such a behavior like topic control. Okay, so here in this thing you have, I have a, a bunch of boxes and each of them represents a different sociolinguistic behavior. And I haven't defined them yet, I will do this in a second. But we would like to be able to compose those behavior or recognize those behaviors based on those indicators in text or in speech. And then once we do that, we can then compose those higher level um, objects or phenomena such as influence or leader or group cohesion and so forth. Right? And that social science theory tells us how to do that. But we need to provide this first step and we need to be able to validate them that this is what social science theory suggests is actually comes out in the reality. So what are those social linguistic behaviors? Again, we reach to the social science theory, multiple uh, publications on that, and what has been identified as reasonable behavior, experimentally and otherwise. So, for instance, topic control, what it is? Well, attempts by a discourse participant to impose the topic of conversation. Okay, fair enough. Now, how do we recognize that by picking up features from, from a, a text? Okay, so that's a, that's a challenge. Um, task control, effort by a group member to define group goal and steer group towards it. Okay, again, this is pretty <laughs> high level definition. How are we going to recognize it from text? Um, topical positioning, speaker's attitude to main topics, we call them other topics of discussion. And so for disagreement, making explicit, implicit utterances of disagreement. We're talking here about kind of general disagreeability. Some, somebody is general disagreeable, argues all the time, right? We want to capture that. All right, um, I'm not going to go through all of this. The next one here. Uh, emotive language use, uh, attempts to influence readers by appealing to their emotions, uh, social positioning, sociability, involvement, degree of engagement in the discussion. Okay, that seems to somewhat easier to imagine, you know, how, how much you speak, how much you participate. Um, network centrality, degree to which others direct the comments and cite topics of a speaker. Now, the, 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 this one is interesting because in, uh, in social network analysis, for instance, there is such a concept of network centrality, where it, which simply mean, very often means that you are somehow centrally located in the network. Uh, so we have many links coming through you or to you or out of you. Um, now, this definition goes beyond that. That is, you, you, you don't need to be directly connected in order to be central, right? It's enough that people somehow pick up things that you introduce, right? So this is this interesting uh, extension here, and so forth. All right, so we try to now build ways of recognizing such behaviors. So we, we need to look at the specific example. Um, and we look at topic control, SLB, social linguistic behavior. We take a closer look at that. Um, so again, this is attempts by a Discord participant to impact or impose the topic of conversation. Now, before I tell you how to do that, right? uh, a few caveats here. First of all, topic control can only be observed over the length of a discourse, right? Clearly, that's probably not particularly surprising. The other thing is that degree of topic control is relative to other participant behaviors. So other people have to somehow let you do this, right? And then different speakers may display varying degrees of topic control. So it's not a binary concept. It's you have it or you don't. You have a degree of this, okay? Um, so our objective is to have this automatically detected by computing local topic chains through the discourse. So we will start looking at that. Um, and before I move on, there's another thing I want to mention here, is that topic control has been found to correlate with speaker influence in discourse. We will talk about influence in a little bit. And so I want you to remember that this is one of the indicators of influence. Okay, so moving on next one here. So let's look at our little dialogue again. Okay, this is the same little piece. 
And so uh, this is about selecting candidates, right? So the names of the candidates obviously appear in this dialogue. And one of them is Carla, who is highlighted here in red. And the first time that name occurs in this dialogue is in turn number 45, where speaker LE mentions that name for the first time. This is first mention. Okay? And later on, we look at this dialogue, there's another mention, in turn 48, another speaker mentions that name again. Okay? And then if you look down, you see this mention again, and sometimes later on, just by pronoun. Okay? So what we get in the end is a chain. Right? So whether speaker early intended this or not, he's had other people talking about this topic for a while, right? So we may say that he got a degree of topic control for a while anyway, right? Okay, so now, so how we define this then, um, uh, the topic control, then how we, how we implement this? We need uh, a few what we call indices or measures to do this. So one of them is a, degree or a number of local topic introduction. That's a rate at which each speaker introduces new local topics into conversation. Okay? And then we need those topics to be picked up by others. So there is another measure called subsequent mentions of topics. The rate at which each speaker refers to topics already in conversation. Okay? So we will credit the person who introduced the topic by having others mention that. And we also separate this to between your own mention and other people mentioned. So site score is a, is a mentions by other people, not you. Right? So in, the, in our the dialogue, the speaker LE introduced the topic, but then stays away. Other people carry this on, no problem. But sometimes the speaker may have to come back, the one who introduced and sort of bridge that conversation so it carries on. Okay? So we want to distinguish the situation. And then finally, turn length. Um, you know, average length of your turn in a dialogue um, is said by uh, to be correlating with the topic control. Not too surprising because the, the longer you speak, the more chances are that you say something that other people will pick up on. Okay, so all these four in indices um, measure the same phenomenon, and that is topic control. Um, and they highly correlate. I will show you this, a little graph on that. Um, interesting mention here uh, is that uh, social media uh, have this uh, subsequent mention functionality essentially built into them, right? So they like in, uh, in, uh, in Facebook or retweet in, in Twitter, uh, this is exactly the mechanism to do that, okay? This is very interesting to note. Okay, so, um, so now if you, if you want to build a topic control uh, model, then uh, we need to uh, somehow combine these uh, four behaviors, okay? And then, um, we uh, came up with a just linear combination, and the, the parameters, the weights here, are um, based on the training data and also on the correlation that is seen between those measures and and the topic control measure. Okay, so um, and and so that is that is done by machine learning. Uh, so here's and an the next uh, slide here, uh, you see the how those uh, um, uh, this, these measures correlate. Uh, together, you see this uh, um, correlation is very high. Um, so this is very pleasing that this we, not only this all uh, explain the same phenomenon, but also explain the totality of this phenomenon in some sense. Okay. okay. So now, having topic control model, we can now say so I said earlier that this is part of an influence model. Can we build an influence model out of this? Okay. Well, we need to be able to also. Uh, um, identify other behaviors that correlate with being influential. And those are network centrality, argument diversity, disagreement, topical positioning, and motive language use. Now, a couple of them are with dashed lines. I'll explain this a little bit. Um, so network centrality, obviously, that is the, something that we all know, probably many of us here, that this is this is correlates with influential. Argument diversity, uh, it's how how uh, diverse is your language and uh, and how well you argue and disagreement surprisingly maybe is also part of influence and model. Um, topical positioning is something that we added later on and uh, we'll talk about this a little more in in a bit. Emotive language use was something that uh, the social science theory suggested that it should correlate here it should be part of this, but turns out it didn't it didn't pan out. 
we didn't find correlation. The correlation was weak, so we actually didn't use that. Okay? So this was one of the things that we couldn't verify. Um, and again, here, we, uh, so the initial model is based on these four behaviors, but they're combined linearly, and then uh, we train them on the annotated data. Um, it, it, but you look across cultures here, it, we see that some of those behaviors weight more uh, and than others, depending on the, on the culture. So, for instance, in, uh, in uh, English, generally English, uh, Western type dialogue, um, we have the topic control is this the heaviest weight on the influencer model. But in, uh, for instance, in Chinese language, uh, the argument diversity is the one that heaviest, there's the heaviest weight. So, which is interesting observation. Um, okay, and again, things correlate nicely. Um, on the left side here, you see the uh, chat room style conversations with correlation on, on those behaviors. And on the right hand side here, you see there's some very new stuff that we just uh, did recently. Um, in the GitHub repository, uh, when people work together and exchange messages and exchange uh, commands and so forth. And again, these behaviors correlate so nicely. Um, and that's a very interesting observation too. Um, how well it works? Uh, we are pretty pleased with how well it works. Uh, this, the results here shown on this slide are from uh, uh, government evaluations uh, on data that we haven't seen. Um, the baseline uh, typically uh, it depends on how many people are uh, involved. Uh, so picking somebody at, at random um, would, would be the baseline typically. Um, uh, this is across multiple uh, settings, small groups and medium groups and so forth. Uh, unweighted model is when we simply uh, do average of all metrics. Um, and, and of course that is reasonable but not great. Once we start weighing them properly, we get pretty good performance. Okay. Um, there, is a, um, there, there are a couple of comments here at the bottom that I will, will, will leave uh, for now. Um, there, there are some other behaviors, for instance, Chinese uh, leader, there, there is uh, something called tension focus. That's a behavior that only exists in Chinese leader um, uh, <coughs> model, but not in English. Um, so now let's see, kind of summarize what I just said uh, briefly before I move on to, to some extensions of it. Um, so the, what are key de features of this particular design? Uh, one is that models are derived from linguistic features in any kind of discourse. So we, we pick up in linguistic features and of any discourse whatsoever and can try to build those behaviors. Uh, so we have topics and co-references, dialogue acts, and so forth, whatever we can compute. And the fact that those um, uh, early processes may not necessarily be very accurate is all right because we ex effectively really exploit language redundancy. If we miss something here, we get something else. We miss that signal, we get another signal. So that's pretty good. Um, there's this two-tire design, right? We have the behaviors and then this larger phenomena. Um, it, uh, it follows essentially what social science theory tells us. Also, it's easier to handle things this way, but it's not necessarily that it has to be that way. There could be more levels. It could be one, maybe. Who knows? Um, the, the other thing I want to mention is that these models are relative. That is, if you have one group or one big or small group or, or, or interactive situation, and you find that they have particular dynamics, and that somebody is a leader, somebody is influencer, and so forth. Uh, if you move that to some of these folks to another situation, they may not have the same behavior. They may not have the same uh, degree of, for instance, leadership. A leader in one group may not be a leader in another group. An uh, influential person in one setting may not be influential in another setting. It's all relative. Um, all of these measures that we introduced are back by social science at least one way or another. So we, we didn't make up any of this. Okay? Um, and in all cases, we carefully validated uh, whatever we found in literature um, through um, control experiments. Again, before moving on to large-scale validations. Okay. Um, so, but the question naturally arises now. Okay, well, can what if we don't have prior social science research? Can we discover such things directly from data? Um, so, for instance, can we take a very large set of interactions and automatically learn? 
clearly in unsupervised way because we don't know what you're looking for. Right? Social phenomena that occur between participants. Okay? Well, can we test that? We can test that. We can take something we know exists, like topic control behavior, and just you know, discover this from data. Okay? Well, I, I haven't tried that, but probably we can. Somebody maybe can try that. Um, can higher level phenomena such as influence be likewise learned bottom up from data? Right? Forget about middle level, just just learn that. Just find, find get the model. Um, then those are things that I don't know the answer to. Uh, that may be tempting to answer, um, and but but I'd be I'd be quite interested in uh, in in exploring that. Um, all right. So so this is this is the basic model. But now um, there are some extensions I want to mention briefly here. Um, so one of them. So once we once we know how to recognize certain behaviors or certain phenomena. Um, we may be interested also to know what impact they're having, what, what, what is this that they do. So if somebody is influential, yeah, okay, that's fine, but what, what impact does it have on others, for instance? Um, so could we somehow measure that? Can we measure, for instance, how much somebody is impacted, how much somebody's opinion about something would change under influence of somebody else, under persuasion, right? Can we measure that how much that happens? That it happens A and then how much, right? And so this topical positioning behavior that I mentioned earlier was, was something that we found to be an excellent uh, vehicle for doing this. Okay, so while, once we can measure the impact of certain behaviors on other people, okay, we call this human environment, so forth, um, we can then attempt to build an artificial robot right, who could do that, right? Because that robot could then not only attempt to do this, but also measure if it's actually having an effect, okay? So you can start with something simple, like put a robot in the chat room and have it change the topic of conversation, right? But then maybe something more challenging, put them in a the chat room, but have them persuade people to change opinion. And maybe even more challenging, right? make them someone believe something that they haven't so far, right? So this, uh, um, and maybe more. Okay? So um, I, I will have some partial answer to those things. Okay? All right, so here's another look at this uh, topical positioning behavior as part of the influencer model. Okay? Um, and it sits on a couple of uh, these indices of measure that I explained in a second. Okay? So what it is, so the, it is social and linguistic behavior um, and the component of this extended influential model. And what it does directly, when, when we try to recognize it, it's, uh, it captures speaker position towards topics or issues. Right? We want to see how people think about some particular topics. But indirectly, it also shows the, um, the impact of influential behaviors in, of other people in debate. Okay? So we will see how perhaps those opinions Keep changing. Okay. A couple of indices on which this is based. One is a called topic polarity index. It basically counts speaker polarized utterances on each topic. So we need to have this topic training and so forth and so forth. And each time somebody says something on this topic, we have to identify the polarity with which they say that. And, and then the strength of this polarity is also interesting. A strength is measured both in, by using um, intensifiers that people say something, they dislike something very much, or so forth, but also how many times they say that, okay? especially in a conversation, how many times they will repeat their, their, their particular opinion. And then we combine these two uh, to have an, a position towards a topic. Right? Now, if you have multiple topics in a conversation, then we could have a vector right, assigned to each speaker. And for each topic, we'll have a position. Okay? And then, so across all these topics, we'll have a sort of combined position of this speaker um, on the general conversation topic, right? That, that covers multiple topics that occur inside the conversation. Okay, so here, here's an example of that. Um, in, there's a, there's a, um, um, a, the, in the conversation discussion about, it's, it's been done a long time ago, uh, the Bush administration and Iraqi's war, um, a speaker, George, 
um, had certain opinions about different topics or certain polarities. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the topics are identified automatically, so they're not necessarily immediately clear what the, uh, um, the, the those labels are not necessarily immediately very informative. There's Bush, Obama, you know, country, public image, administration, Iraq. Um, so in early in conversation, George has some negative opinion about both presidents, and then and then really nothing to say about the other things. But later on, this whole thing changes. So something happened to him during this conversation. Somehow he's been influence. And then another example below, it's a, a, it's a, this, our a, a YMCA discussion, uh, when Speaker Meg has some particular opinion about uh, things in the beginning and then somewhat different opinions later. Okay? Um, so we can see that there's sort of a general position uh, over things that changes. Okay? And if you think about this as vectors, that those vectors move in two different directions. Right? So you can measure how much change occur. Um, so topical positioning then is a measure of effects of influence or persuasion, um, and that can be used uh, in addition to being a, a, a simply a, a behavior. Uh, so uh, topical positioning can show relative distance between participants. Um, for instance, we can uh, use some of that cosine metric um, between the vectors uh, to see um, how different people differ on topics. Now, typically a conversation is about something, and there are some aspects of this bigger topic that occur, and then we would see how different people uh, um, see themselves in this space of, of topics uh, that, that are covered by the conversation. Um, and then this measure, TPM, or typical positioning measure, um, uh, can also show uh, how participants' positions evolve over time during this discussion. Um, so we can see the, what the relative distances between participants at the outset, and then the relative positions at the end of the discussion. Are they getting closer to one another or farther apart? Right? In particular, um, we want to see what the, how the position of each person in the, in the debate um, changes with respect to the influencer. So we can find who the influencer is and see whether people get closer to them. So then, then that will be that they have successfully influenced others. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe people move away. And they, they are very unsuccessful at this. Um, so, so TPM can show effective influence in discussion. And uh, we may be able to quantify that. Right, by, by looking at how much those vectors shift. Okay. Um, so now, when we look at this um, in chat room situations, this all seemed you know, worked pretty nice. And, and our hunch was verified. We, we run a number of uh, experiments with uh, uh, people being surveyed before and after, and then and then uh, uh, checking whether their opinions, in fact, sh uh, shifted the way uh, our metrics show. But, um, but there was something missing. In the, there, were, there were some other situations where it didn't quite work so well. So um, we noticed that, especially in the political discussions, where, where people have different beliefs, uh, we have to take that portion into account. So the, the speaker sentiment towards a topic explaining part of the attitude channel. So the other uh, factor is belief. Uh, whether a speaker believes the topic or, uh, is true or not. Okay? And that's important. Right? Um, in other words, speaker's position on a topic involves both belief and sentiment. Right? So, so far, okay, I mean, the next few slides, right? um, I assume, we or we or all together assume basically that uh, all topics are factual in the sense that either they are true or not, and everybody believes them to be true, or everybody believes them to be false, right? But once you have situations where people may believe something and other people may not believe the same thing, right? then we have to take that into account, and also perhaps how much they believe or don't believe something, right? Because that then makes a part of the attitude. Right? So um, here's a, a you know, little example of that, what that could mean. Um, 
So GMO is a gen genetically modified organism. Right? Um, so somebody to combine belief and sentiment would, mean, would be something like that. GMOs pollute the environment, and then sentiment would be something like polluting the environment is bad. Now we combine these two, we get a uh, position or attitude. Right? So this is the kind of full position. This negative towards uh, a GMO, and we can quantify this somehow, right? So now we try to find a way to do this, um, find some mechanism to combine sentiment and belief nicely. Um, and so uh, one model that uh, is possible is summative model of belief. That is uh, the citation here at the bottom of the page. Um, that actually um, Samir Ashaik, my PhD student, who's hopefully in the audience somewhere, uh, came up with this. Um, and so this allows us to combine nicely the sentiment and belief into a, a single positioning vector, if you want, if you will. So here's another example. Uh, this is a, a set of beliefs somebody has um, the, about the GMOs, that they pollute the environment. Yes, I believe that. They're adaptable to manic climates. No, I don't believe that. Uh, it's more affordable. Yes, sure, it is leads to less starvation, I don't believe that, right? But at the same time, they have some sentiment. Okay? So the, the fact that they pollute the environment is true, I believe this, but this is a bad thing. And they're adaptable to money climates, I don't believe this, but if it were, it would be great, okay? I would be, I would be for it. Okay, so now you, if you combine this, you get the, a, this B times S vector, okay? Which is a, it's a more accurate uh, representation of your position on, uh, on those topics. Okay, so this is the extended vector. Now, with that, we may be ready to uh, build a robot that could uh, um, uh, persuade people to do things and and uh, and and measure how how much uh, how much effect is having. So, how we could do that? Um, we first of all, the, the, having this extended vector um, gives us some ways of of creating strategies for how we can approach persuasion if we want to do this uh, through automatic bot. So how we can change somebody's position? I mean, there are multiple ways now. The one is that changing somebody's belief polarity or strength. Right? So we could say, well, it's, maybe you shouldn't believe this so strongly. Or maybe it's actually true. Okay? So we can try to persuade that. If that doesn't work, we can try to um, change sentiment towards something. Okay, well, maybe it is not so bad as you think it is. Okay, uh, okay. Maybe in fact it's good. Okay. That's another strategy. Now, if this still doesn't work, right, then we can add new beliefs, introduce new beliefs into your belief system, and maybe plant them with the appropriate, appropriate sentiment. Right, that that will also shift those vectors. Right, so you have multiple ways to do this, and so. Um, so a, a robot like this could uh, uh, have multiple strategies and try to uh, work um, a room <laughs> um, in order to see what is having effect and measuring this after each step, measuring how much impact it's having. Yeah. So, so we we build that. In fact, that was um, again Samira's work, PhD dissertation, um, to build a bot that could go into a, um, a chat room. And persuade people to change opinions about controversial topics. And we we used some topics that were not totally terribly controversial, but but the topics that were, we hope that people could be persuaded on, such as, for instance, changing the um, a drinking age uh, that um, uh, from 18 to or from 21 to 18 or something or, or things like that. And 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 turns out that that yes, a bot can effectively persuade people, not everyone, but number of people, um, to change their opinion. Sometimes slightly, sometimes a lot, but we can measure that. Right? We can measure this um, as we go uh, forward. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so this, is, uh, um, this is sort of where we are, but um, now I wanted to comment a few words on the, um, what kind of applications we may have beyond this basic model or even this extended model. So this is all so far mostly research. Right? We, 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 yes, we have this. Yes, it works. Yes, it can be applied to a robot. But now, how can we apply to some practical applications, kind of practical context? 
Um, so here's some some examples. They're not by, by all means not even close to what what the other uh, what other opportunity scheme may be. But let's start with one. Um, main, so one is maintaining optimal interaction dynamics in a task-oriented group. Um, well, it is sort of uh, um, reasonably well known that depending on how well uh, people behave in, a, in a, some group, that, that whether the group will succeed on, on their task or they don't. And so um, another of the PhD students who was involved in the, in the, with us um, uh, run a little project where he was looking at uh, uh, interaction between group of students who had the simple physics problems to build some um, uh, um, uh, con simple conceptions. And it turns out that when they were, uh, the dynamics were very equitable with, during the group, they were more likely to succeed on average than, than in a situation when one person was in total control or was most dominating the group. Um, so clearly that could be monitored uh, by, by observing what they're doing and automatically and you know, the attention was here to alert the teacher who may be uh, monitoring number of groups, uh, maybe even online, um, that th th that particular group needs help or needs to, need to be, inter some intervention is required. Uh, we thought that it would be particularly helpful in situations where it is online learning, online teaching, um, when you have maybe many, many groups that have to work something and, and so the, uh, this automatic monitoring would be helpful. And another application is measuring public opinion and effects of influence campaigns. Okay, so this is taking that model and on the level of the society level and, and see, for instance, first see what positions people have and then see if any kind of campaign that we build could actually a risk having effect, right? And uh, in, in you could possibly swing opinions, or at least part of the group. Um, this is a little tougher, right? Because we, we're not talking about individuals, but talking about whole groups being shifted, but we may start with <laughs> turning individuals. Um, so one example of uh, work that we attempted to do in this direction um, was uh, a studying public opinions on gun ownership. That was a study that we conducted a few years ago as part of a Another IARPA program called Metaphor, um, and so the uh, idea was to see how far those uh, uh, different sides and in the U.S. particularly how far apart on issues they are and where the commonalities are and maybe what kind of um, um, campaign can be uh, uh, constructed to to bridge this gap and bring them closer together. This this is quite interesting too. Um, Another application um, is uh, uncovering and exploiting real life identity of online personas. Um, so here, the situation is that you are in, a straight, in uh, an environment where, where people are hiding behind something. Uh, they don't reveal who they are. And you may want to know what the intentions are, what the, who they are. Um, so one situation we, we, one kind of research we did, one kind of uh, application, was um, um, figuring out who are the people behind the avatars in in, uh, in online games, such as, for instance, Second Life or World of Warcraft, um, where the groups of people play together, shoot and so forth, and they chit chat and so forth. But but we don't know who they are. It's very often they pretend to be somebody else. And, and the question was, can we based on the behavioral signatures that they leave. Right? But the way they speak, the way they move their avatars around even, because that was another dimension here that is beyond language. Um, and we figure out who they are in your life. Right? What is the gender, what is the age, <laughs> um, even what their political views may be. Right? Um, and, not to, and of course, who the leader is, so far, you could, you could uh, figure out that too. So this was part of another IARPA program. Um, Paul Reynard, that was, uh, um, again, a few years ago. Um, and, and that concept actually extends beyond this, this and here this practical application in cybersecurity, um, particularly in, 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 in a situation such as uh, phishing or so-called social engineering, where, where someone wants to get you do something, you know, give them your credit card number or, or, or click on some link. 
Um, how, how, how do you know that, uh, how do you recognize that they actually are not real, that they actually mean harm? And is there a way to do this without, um, you know, giving away uh, or even mixing up this with the actual real, um, um, actual legitimate contacts, right? So, so this is another area where, where this technology may be helpful. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, I mean, that's not finally, but the final on this particular slide um, is the simulation of information cascades in social networks. This is something that um, immediately after the end of the skill program, immediately we figured that this is exactly the, the next thing that we should be looking at. So the, the conversations in the chat rooms, the conversation in the, in discussion forums, even uh, uh, in some other online environments, that's one thing. But but when you go to this open media like Twitter or Facebook and so forth, that's a whole other dimension because people suddenly don't really quite talk to one another. They sort of broadcast things and everybody hears that. And, and there is this network connectivity issue and so forth. So one of the things that we all want to know is what makes some piece of information go viral. You know, how we can predict that, right? Um, and so we hope that uh, that uh, the social behavioral uh, features, that the dynamics in this, in, the, in between some people in a group, uh, the way people react to certain things, the, the, the way people carry a message, uh, will reveal, give us early indication that something will go viral, something will be very popular. Um, and so we right now in the program, uh, the DARPA program, uh, we, we try to exploit this, uh, the social sim program, um, where we try to see if that is in fact could be done. That is, we can have a, a much more accurate prediction of what, uh, uh, what the popularity means, what the viral means uh, in, in social network context. Um, okay, so I think uh, um, with this, I... I think I'll stop here. The next uh, uh, slide is just to thank you. I want to acknowledge my funders uh, uh, clearly who provided funding for this research over the years, um, uh, this, and, uh, in particular IARPA, also Army Research Labs and DARPA and Air Force Research, um, also some in industrial uh, uh, sponsors that um, I'm not sure if I can mention them or not. They, we, we had plenty of funding for this. Um, and uh, there are also some disclaimers here um, that, that I need to uh, that I put here. Also, I wanted to acknowledge that although I present this work, um, and this is not just my work, there's a number of people who were uh, deeply involved in this, and without them, this would not be possible at all. And so I mentioned them here, and the Aaron Broadwell and King Liu, Samira Sheikh, um, I mentioned her already, uh, Jennifer Stomergali. Sarah Taylor, Nick Webb, and many, many graduate students who contributed to this. So I, I want to acknowledge that they were part of that. Um, so with that, I think I, I'm going to uh, pass back to uh, Rose and, uh, and Taman um, if they want to uh, um, take over with, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank yeah, you, Tom. Come back for... Go ahead, Taman. Yeah, no, no. Thank you very much. Uh, the, that was uh, uh, very exciting and uh, actually very intriguing uh, uh, discussion and uh, um, research. And uh, actually, we do have quite a few questions, uh, and I will try to go through a few of those uh, in the remaining time and ask you uh, ask you those questions. Uh, and uh, for some of the questions that that we may not be able to answer, we can. Uh, uh, ask you to respond in writing. Uh, so I'll start very quickly. There were a couple of questions related to weight co uh, computation. There's a question from mm -hmm. uh, Joseph uh, Quelio from uh, Marquette University asking uh, how are uh, weights uh, uh, computed and also uh, uh, similarly uh, Basically, I think Juan was asking uh, from, from Jefferson County, basically, is the system primarily based on universal measure data values, or are there any cultural and psychological values used as uh, weight factors? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you for this question. So the, I, I'm not sure if I can completely answer the second question, but the, the, generally the weights were determined um, 
based on uh, the training data that we had. So we had a, um, a certain number of uh, dialogues that were hand annotated. Um, we made a, a, a very strong effort to make sure that the annotators are trained properly. This took many, many hours, uh, sometimes uh, as many as 80 hours of training before we got the right into annotated agreement. Um, so uh, people were annotating uh, and uh, dialogues, and based on that, we would train uh, the weights um, um, so that we can uh, uh, get the the performance agree with the human judgment, okay? Um, and, and multiple levels. Uh, also, the, the correlations that we, we found, the correlations were indicators which um, of those uh, uh, components um, are more important than others. So those which were correlating better uh, were weighted more, and those with correlating less uh, were weighted less. And so that was the, uh, the, the way to do it. And so, um, our training data uh, was originally the chat room uh, dialogues that the ones similar to ones I, I show you in, uh, in slides. Uh, and those were with people who recruited for that purpose. Um, and then later on, um, uh, those were the government uh, data that were used in tests and then released to us um, um, afterwards with the, with the independent annotations that we also used for uh, verifying that our um, tr initial training was 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 right, and generally, I have to say that um, uh, across different genres of of dialogue, for instance, chat room versus uh, discussion uh, forums, um, versus for instance Wikipedia discussion, so forth. Generally, those weights were stable if within single language. Um, they would differ uh, if we go to Chinese language, it goes to Persian language, they, they would differ um, for cultural reasons, we believe. Okay. So that's, I don't know if this answers the question completely, but that's a, um, that's a long answer. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, there's another question from, from Michael from Boeing. Uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you also identify um, score models, traits, and behaviors that ostracize and minimize influence? Ah, a, a very good, uh, a very good question. Um, it, it, yes, this is something that uh, sh probably should be done. We, I don't think we actually specifically uh, model that, but it, clearly that this is there are many different behaviors that we could model, and and I'm hoping that this general framework uh, could serve as a guide on how to do this. On the, but but not not completely. That is, we we had situations where uh, we, we we look at situations where there were multiple influencers in a, uh, in in a in a conversation, and they would sort of cancel each other out. Um, so the question was, which of them pulls people closer to themselves? Um, so possibly it's simply that one influencer can uh, cancel another influencer, um, and and that may be it. Um, Although I, I appreciate the, the point here that there could be someone who is simply disrupting <laughs> things, um, and and that may be just the point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we have uh, time for one more question. And I'll summarize. There are uh, actually several people asking uh, about conversational agents or chatbots, and uh, the general question mm -hmm. is uh, any application of the feasibility of injecting. Uh, um, uh, some capability into conversational agents and uh, also, uh, yeah, ba basically in, in that general domain. Um, thank you for that question. Yes, um, I, 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 we believe so very much. I mean, that so, so uh, Samira Sheikh's the dissertation demonstrated that this is feasible, that uh, 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 we can insert uh, an, an, a, a chatbot in, uh, in, in the, inside the group of people, they will not necessarily be aware of that. And, and this uh, chatbot uh, does the work. Um, and, 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 and people may not realize that they are being taken, taken for a ride in some sense. Um, the other thing about the chatbot that we know this uh, is that the chatbot is clever enough, okay, I was saying quotes, that <laughs> to leverage that uh, somebody else uh, will pick up on the particular line of argument. Uh, is making and let them do it. 
That is, you will not necessarily press the point if somebody else in the group will, will pick it up. Okay, so and that is actually a very interesting uh, way of, of not o doing overkill. Right? So let, let people do it if they can do this on their own. You essentially are here to make sure that what you want to happen is happening. Right? Um, so I think in that, in that sense, it, it, that kind of gives us probably the strategy how to insert uh, this type of bot into uh, real situations. Uh, we did uh, do all kinds of silly experiments, including dropping a, a chat, uh, at the chatbot into uh, an actual live uh, chat room and with the single purpose of having people talk about something else for a while, uh, which was actually quite successful, hilarious in some sense. Um, because in one case, the bot was summarily kicked out of the chat room uh, as being too annoying without people realizing it's a bot. So it was, uh, it was interesting. Thank you, Tomek. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. And I'd like to thank you, thank Tomek again for his informative presentation and the answers to, to the questions. There's more questions and, and we may be able to answer them in the link that gets sent out. And a special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at webinar.acm.org. And you can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at the learning.acm.org and at acm.org. Um, also, there's a survey that will be available um, that I would be interesting at SurveyMonkey. The link is on your screen. Um, if you would be willing to take it, it'll only take a couple minutes um, so you could suggest future topics or speakers. So just on behalf of ACM, SIGAI, Tomek Plamen, and myself, Rose Paradis, thanks again for joining us. And I hope you will join us again next month at our next webinar. Please take a few minutes for the survey and take a look at the SIGAI web pages. If you Google SIGAI, you can see what we're doing and join our group. Thank you all for attending and see you next time. This concludes the webinar.